but he was telling me, he said, you know, you're, you're fortunate that you trained in chicken go under James Lee instead of Bruce. And of course, that, that kind of took me back. And I said, well, why do you say that? What's up, everybody? It's episode 66 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, Professor Gary Dill. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I founded Whistlekick, but on Martial Arts Radio, I'm your host. Whistlekick, as many of you know, makes the world's best sparring gear, as well as some great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners and fans of the traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome our new listeners and thank those of you tuning in again. If you're not familiar with our products, why don't you head on over to whistlecake.com and take a look at what we make. We've been selling a lot of sweatshirts lately, both our warm, cozy pullover hoodies and our lighter weight, super comfy zip ups. You can check those out and see the great colors they come in, like I said, over on the website. But if you want to see the show notes, those are on a completely different website and that one is whistlecakemartialartsradio.com. I know, we're really creative with our domain names. While you're over there, go ahead and sign up for the newsletter. We offer special content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Just like with episode 64, this one features a quiz. So after you've listened, head on over to the website, go to the show notes, take the quiz, and see how you stack up to others on the leaderboard. We have a new review to share with you, and this one's from TKD Professional. It's a five-star review, and it's titled, best martial arts podcast ever, with quite a few exclamation points. I've been a fan of the martial arts most of my life, and I've also been a practitioner for more than five years. This is the best martial arts podcast I have ever listened to. Thank you for such a great show. Well, thank you for that review, and we really appreciate it. We appreciate all of the reviews. And remember, if you leave us a review, we send you free whistle kick stuff. So go ahead, TKD Professional, shoot us an email, info at whistlekick.com. And we'll get that stuff out to you. Now, today's episode brings us Professor Gary Dill. He's a multidisciplined martial artist best known for being one of the few remaining original students of Jeet Kune Do, the martial art pioneered by Bruce Lee. Now, while this is absolutely not an episode about Bruce Lee, it's impossible to discuss Professor Dill's history and views on martial arts without the legend's name being thrown around a little bit. After the episode closed, Professor Dill continued sharing amazing stories. And some of those stories are tacked on here at the end of the episode, so be sure to listen past our normal closing. But rather than keep talking about what's going on in this episode, I'd rather just turn it over to Professor Dill. So, without further ado, Professor Dill, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm glad to uh, have the opportunity to, to be on your show. Well, I'm, I'm honored to have you here. You are going to be our first true Jeet Kune Do practitioner, and not that we're out there searching out people of different styles, because I think you know a lot of people get bogged down in style versus style, but it's nice to mix it up once in a while, bring in some people with some different background. And of course, you've been around in Jeet Kune Do for quite a while, so you've got some ties back to some early lineage, and I know we're going to get into that later, but let's start, let's go back to the beginning, the very beginning. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I started when I was uh, 16 years old in high school, and I was looking for a uh, self-defense, a uh, better way to fight. Because uh, I uh, had tendencies to uh, have a short temper in high school, and uh, so I thought there's got to be a better way. So I started taking uh, karate and jiu-jitsu. And that's, like I said, I was 16. been with it ever since. Okay, great. So where were you at that point? Were you were you a West Coast guy? Were you an no, East Coast no, no, guy? No, no. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Oh, okay. So you're smack down the middle. Oh yeah, I've been there. Okay. You know long time. Born and raised there, I'm there now. Okay. So tell us what early karate and jujitsu looked like in Oklahoma back when you started. Oh yeah, it was uh, it was rough. Uh, you know, there's no soccer boppers, none of that equipment. Uh, the only protective gear you had was a quick set of hands, you know, for blocking. 
uh, your geese, and of course, uh, these were the old geese where they looked like pedal pushers where the bottom of them came up to your knees. And, uh, but it was, uh, you know, the old school karate, they call it the, back here, uh, you know, the tournaments we had back in Oklahoma and Texas, they call it the blood and gut stakes. And there's a reason for that because it was the precursor to full contact. And, uh, if you're in a tournament and if you don't make contact, you don't get the point. And so it, it got pretty rough and it was fun. You found out real quick what you can do and what you can't do. And, uh, you, you learned, uh, you learned the meaning, the meaning of speed because if you're not quick, you're not. And so that's, that's the old days. Uh, like I said, no, no equipment, just bare knuckle. Uh, I liked it. That's what it's all about, man, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, of course, we've had some guests on that have referenced, you know, that early era, that blood and guts martial arts era. And a lot of those early stories come out of Texas. I mean, some of some yeah. of the great yeah. martial artists from that area were, were from Texas. Did you have a chance to oh, God, yeah. work we with go any down. of them? Oh, yeah. We go down and whip their sad all the time on tournaments. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah uh, we, we we were going back and forth all the time fighting tournaments down there. Uh, I was under Lou Angel, and uh, we go down. We'd fight uh, Alan Steen's boys. Uh, we'd fight, uh, and uh, I went brain dead. Anyway, Pat Burleson fight his boys, and they come up and fight us. And uh, I think all the you know all the old guys you know were there when they were young. Yeah. Yeah, it you know, it's an incredible time in in our in martial arts history and as I talk to guests on the show as I do research on things, you know, read books, it's a time I wish I could go back even just, you know, to check out a couple tournaments from then because we don't have anything like that today. No. No, you don't. You really don't. Uh, they got all that protective gear and actual technique and skill. You know, it goes out the window. Uh, that's my opinion. Yeah, yeah, quite often, absolutely. I'm, I'm old school. I've been in the martial arts for uh, 52, 53 years now. That, that's a while. You've been around enough to see some things and, and certainly see the progression as it's happened through the United States. Progression or, or you could say, degression. Yeah, yeah, shift. I mean, we can be we can be PC here and say change. Yeah. But, you know, there's there's certainly... There are advantages on both sides of it. I mean, you're not going to put a six-year-old into an environment like that. No, 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 no. Uh, back in those so, days, there's, there were no kitty classes, you know, teenagers and adults. And that was it. Right. So, of course, if you've been training for 52 years and, you know, you were part of that early era, that, that golden era that so many of us look back on and, and wish we could have been there, I know you've got some great stories, so I'd like you to take a second and think about those stories and tell us what's your best one. Oh God, way back then, I see, I don't know. Uh, <sighs> you put me on the spot there. I got to remember. I did. That's something. my job. Yeah, I got to remember something. What the hell? Ah, <laughs> uh, gee, I don't know. Just. Uh, just a hard training we went through, you know, uh, we two hour class would feel like it's six hours, you know, I mean, there's no breaks. It's, uh, uh, like been in Marine Corps boot camp, you know, and, and when your old karate classes doing knuckle push ups and, uh, doing leg races with uh, Lou Angel coming by and jumping on your belly from one person to the other, uh, getting out there and, and sparring and, uh, you, you don't quit till they say you're done, you know? And, uh, it was, you know, a good, uh, it was good training. I don't regret it one bit. Uh, just, uh, I remember all the knocks I got and the big bumps on my legs and won't forget this one time I was in a tournament, I was beginning white belt and, I was fighting this guy about three size, three sizes bigger than me. 
I weighed maybe 145 or 50. And I decided I was going to do a, uh, a jumping shoot toe on him, and I forgot to cover my groin. And I, as I was coming down, his front snap kick was right there waiting on me. Oh, boy, did that hurt. I walked around. <laughs> well, I didn't walk around. I waddled around for two or three hours. And that was an eye-opening lesson. You know, pay more attention to your technique. Yeah. So did you get the point? Oh, God, no. (laughs) 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 He beat me like a bastard (laughs) stepchild. Believe it or not, all masters used to be white belts. And if you were a white belt, you also got your side (laughs) whipped. So what was it at 16 that, you know, I mean, you said you were, you were looking for something, you know, cause you, you were a little bit, uh, let's say rougher. Maybe well, some of you. Okay. Watch your question. <laughs> that you were, you were looking for something in the martial arts that you didn't have, you know, with, you know, to, to help you through. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to be delicate here, but you know, let you use your words. Um, but why why martial arts? You know, why not? Oh, man, listen, let, let me tell you, back in the 60s, if you could find a, a karate class, you found the, uh, you found the magic pill that's going to make you a good fighter, you know, because it was new back then. And uh, you see these guys, you know, putting on demonstrations and kicking and breaking bricks and think, oh, wow, yeah, that's where it's at. And, uh, you know, when I was in high school, I wasn't rough. I was actually the opposite. I was the guy with a pocket protector, the thick glasses, like what Bruce Lee used to wear. And I had a slide rule, even had a little case down on my belt. And, and when you are a, shall we say, a nerd, a geek, you also got a target on your back. But I was one of those nerds and geeks that had a temper. So when somebody come up and started giving me a rash of trouble, I'd get it right back. And so I found myself in altercations, you know, more than once. Yeah. And uh, I'd do good in a fight, but then I still get hurt. And I thought, man, there's got to be a better way. And so then uh, I started taking this one karate class. And so I'd drive 30 minutes to class uh, three times a week and uh, you know finally got the hang of it and uh, after that uh, I had one fight after that uh, I just threw one one punch and the guy was out and you know what nobody messed with me anymore hmm. so that's how I got into it okay well that that lines up that make, makes a little more sense maybe I did a poor job listening early on. I apologize. Well, I just dropped that. Absolutely. Give me 10 push-ups, you know? I'll, as, as soon as we're done, I, I, I'll give you 15. Oh, well, I don't uh, knock I yourself out now. <laughs> I, I might. I might. There's a desk here. It's not a big office. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's go back. Let's imagine, you know, that at age 16, you hadn't found martial arts, that you had found something else to occupy your time and, and for, you know, Hopefully you didn't get into any more fights, but you know, your life carried on and you never found martial arts. What do you think you'd be doing now? Oh, I'd be dead. I'd be dead. No doubt about it. Really? I'd be dead. Uh, okay. Why? Martial arts. Hey man, look, the martial arts, it's not just the martial arts. Uh, they're my life. You know, they are who I am. It's what I do. I'm 69 years old. I work out every day. I got to keep up with these guys who are teenagers and in their 20s. And matter of fact, I was working out when you called me up. And, uh, you know, I see people my age and they sit around and they're recliners watching TV and that's their life. I thought, no way. I have nothing in common with those people. Uh, I run and hang out with people half my age and much less than half my age. I have more in common with them if they're in the martial arts. And I don't know, I just can't imagine what it would be like. It would be pure hell. 
I mean, the martial arts are everything for me. Well, it's a great answer and, and um, very similar to the answer that we, we often get, that people just can't imagine what their life would be without it. And I think for a lot of us, there, whether you want to call it destiny or fate or just really, really good luck, that the martial arts fills this hole, this this space within us that for a lot of us is, is missing. Up and but you know, I feel every human being, there's a reason why they're here at this time on this earth. Everybody's got a mission and some people just miss it. They miss their calling. And they go through life just kind of running into walls. But everybody has a purpose. And I think my mission is tied in with teaching people how to survive. And teaching good people how to fight. You know? And I I teach uh, a lot of military, law enforcement. And uh, haven't been in both of those areas myself career-wise. But, uh, you know, I think me teaching the martial arts, that's, that's what I'm supposed to be doing in this lifetime. That's my calling. Some people have a calling for different things to be a teacher. Some people have a calling to be a priest. I have a calling to be a martial arts instructor. Well, there we go. Yeah. Perfect. Well, then it's a good thing that you found your calling, and I'm sure all the people that you've taught over the years have been very fortunate to have learned from you. So our next question really kind of goes, you know, we, we come back from the hypothetical, the, the, you didn't get to train in the martial arts world that really becomes fuzzy when most of us, most of us try to imagine being in that space, but let's come back to reality. Let's talk about your past and let's talk about a challenging time. You know, it could be it could be a day or a year, but tell us about some rough patch that you went through and how your martial arts training helped you move through it. Oh well, of course, uh, been in the military and been in law enforcement. Uh, if it had not been for my martial arts, uh, you would not be talking to me right now. I'd be dead. Well, okay. Tell us more. What what is what does that mean? Well, you know, the martial arts taught me how to survive in combat and gave me the mindset, that warrior mindset to survive. It developed in me, uh, especially when I was in Vietnam, that, that killer instinct, you know. And uh, I know James Lee in Juke and Bell class has always mentioned you can never be good in chicken dough if you don't have the killer instinct. And I told him, yeah, I know what it is. I've been there. And, uh, but, uh, that mindset that you've developed in the martial arts gives you that ability to survive in, on the battlefield and in the military, to survive on the streets when you're, uh, in law enforcement. Because if you don't have that killer instinct, if you don't have the survivor mind, mindset, you won't survive. You become a sheep. Mm. Wow. Powerful stuff. So our next question talks about your instructors, the people that you've had the chance to train with. But before we do that, I can only just imagine some of the listeners out there saying, okay, Jeet Kune Do and, and, you know, they're able to do some math and, and go back and say, okay, you, you started training at around this time. So let's, let's tackle the obvious question that a lot sure. of those people are going to ask. Right. Did you train with Bruce Lee? No, I did not. He was the chief instructor. He was the head of school the whole time that I trained there. But my primary instructor was James Lee. Great. So for listeners out there who are, I, 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 there's a couple of you that I know pretty well. And I, I just, I imagine you screaming. So the question, the, the question the that you're bringing up is, did I touch 
the robe of Bruce Lee. <laughs> I'm right? sure that's how some would, yeah, that's how some people would oh, probably I know. phrase it. I know, yes, the robe of St. Bruce. No, I did not. But I did become his disciple under James Lee. Uh, the whole time that I trained there at the Jukundo School in Oakland, Bruce was the chief instructor. And he was a still hands-on, even though he wasn't there teaching. Uh, he was in Thailand, Hong Kong, and making all of his uh, spaghetti Western kung fu movies. Uh, but he was in contact with James, saying, okay, you know, we're going to take this out of our curriculum, but I want to put this in, and so on and so on. So, you know, James would come down more than once and say, okay, uh, we're taking this out of the program. I just uh, talked to Bruce a couple of days ago, and he said, take this out. And now we're going to, you know, he'll come down and say, okay, we're going to add this now to the program. James did nothing on his own. Everything he taught was strictly uh, per Bruce. And I was fortunate. Uh, matter of fact, uh, a few years ago, uh, Wally J and I, Professor Wally J, a small circle jiu jitsu, we got together at a martial arts event. We had a long talk and a very nice guy. But he was telling me, he said, You know, you're, you're fortunate that you trained in Jikun Do under James Lee instead of Bruce. And of course, that, that kind of took me back. And I said, Well, why do you say that? Of course, James Lee was a very, very good instructor. Don't get me wrong, but, you know, he said, oh, you're lucky you trained with James instead of Bruce. And he went on to say that uh, Bruce was the R&D guy, but James was the guy who documented everything, who structured everything, who formulated everything. Bruce came up with it, but James is one who, like I said, he documented it. And put everything in a in a uh, you know format, and uh, he said Bruce really didn't like to teach that much. And he, he wanted to do it, and he Wally said I he said you know see Wally J lived just in Alameda, which is just a hop and skit from Oakland, so he go there all the time, and he and James and Bruce would uh, would work out. And he said Bruce and James would be in there in that garage developing Jikun Do. This was after that one Jack Man fight, you know. And that's when Bruce got real serious about uh, uh, Jikun Do and combat. And uh, he said they would they would knock each other on the across on those uh, uh, concrete block walls, you know, and just uh, just be harsh, rough. But that's the way they were. And uh, but he said, yeah, as far as uh, having one or the other for the instructor. He said, yeah, you're a lot better off having, having, uh, having James as an instructor. Not taking a thing away from Bruce, but, you know, what is this? Right. Wow. So what was that like living in, a, in an environment where your curriculum was constantly changing? Was it that wasn't, frustrating it, no, or was that no, exciting? No, 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 no. It was not constantly changing. Okay. Just, just sporadically. Okay. And I gave that as an example to let you know that Bruce was still very much in charge of uh, that school and that curriculum. But it wasn't constantly changing. No. It was made up of Wing Chun Gung Fu, Western Boxing, and Fencing. But Bruce would come up with a better way of doing something and he would change it. But it's not like it was going on every day, you know. Now, it was a stable curriculum. Remember, I was in karate for years. I had taught karate for years, and uh, it was a very stable program. It's, it wasn't a martial arts of the month club, okay? Being sure. Tough. No, and, and I wasn't meaning to imply that. Okay. So uh, what I'm comparing it to, you know, when, when I, you know, in the styles that I've trained in, the curriculum is fairly well set. I mean, the, the instructor yeah. may have come up with a new way to instruct something, but right. the way that you throw a punch is the way you throw a punch. And I'm, I I'm thought I was getting the impression that you were training in Jeet Kune Do at the, because it was at the time that it was being developed, that maybe you were experiencing some of those shifts, those refinements. No, no not really. No. Uh, okay. 
I started in 1971. Just uh, matter of fact, I was there just two days after I got back from Vietnam. Uh, now it was a it, it, it was pretty solidified by the time I got there. But Bruce did make changes, which in all martial arts there's going to be changes. Sure. You know, if you don't change, you become a dinosaur. Sometimes there's a real major change, you know. Uh, this is going to upset a lot of people, but I'm going to tell you on this interview. Mm-hmm. We were working on uh, Two Hand Chi Sao. And uh, one night, James Lee came bouncing down the stairs and he said, Well, you guys uh, understand, Phil, uh, you know, Chi Sao? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, Good, because you're not going to see it anymore. And well, kind of look, oh, duh. What do, you, what do you mean? He said, I just got a call from Bruce last night. He said, take uh, the two hand chi sao out of the Chikung Do curriculum. That he felt that it was too time consuming. And uh, because of the amount of time that one had to put into training into chi sao to be effective, that it was not time, it was not applicable for expediency in combat fighting for the amount of time that it took to train in it to get good, that we could be doing other techniques and achieve the same thing. So we went to a one-hand chi sao training in lieu of two hands because the one hand was more applicable to a, uh, you know, someone's arm out there, you know, our punch coming in. And uh, so I was there when he took uh, the uh, the Wing Chun two hand chi sao out of the curriculum. Of course, like I said, a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, Chicken Doe's doing Wing Chun, you know, doing chi sao. But, you know, I was there. Bruce took it out of the curriculum. Now, for listeners, and I guess myself included, who don't have a lot of experience with the Chinese martial arts, what is chi sao? Oh, uh, it's. it's uh, well, uh, chi sao's energy, you know, you, you feel your opponent's energies, you know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're touching, both hands are touching, you're facing each other, he moves, you move, da, 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 and just, you just keep kind of trading back and forth, going in the lock, going the bong, yada, yada. And it's a drill to build up sensitivity to your opponent's energy and rhythm. And Bruce felt that the two-hand chi sao was, uh, uh, it just took too much time out of the uh, training curriculum for no more what you got out of it. And instead, uh, we just did the one hand chi sao, where you are touching one arm of the person and you respond to that one arm technique with whatever angle or speed he's coming in at. So it's hard to explain how to do energy drills by just talking about it. You have to feel it. You have to experience it. Sure. No, I, I completely understand. And from your description, I think I've had some experience with what you're talking about. I just know it by by different names. So I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to try and find some video to demonstrate that we can throw over in the show notes. I'll run it by you first. Okay. See if we can find sure. something that, that yeah, matches there's a lot out what there. we're talking and, about. And, you know, I'm not saying that it's a bad training drill. You know, people want to do it, that's fine. You know, but it's just Bruce took it out of the chicken go curriculum. But it's pretty fundamental in Wing Chun. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Well, you see, this is the thing about it. People think chicken go is Wing Chun. No. It has Wing Chun aspects in it. But if, if Bruce developed chicken go because he felt that from his own experience that he needed more than just Wing Chun for for his combat, for his combat applications. This is why he started to incorporate boxing, fundamentals from fencing. Because Chi Kung Do is made up of three different fighting arts, Wing Chun, Western boxing, and fencing. And he took what he felt was the best from all three arts and combine those into what is known as Chi Kung Do, 
Now, that is the original Chicken Bell. That's the Chicken Bell that Bruce Lee developed, not somebody else. Twenty years later, saying, "Oh well, hell, here we're doing woo woo, why why, we we ga ga, and this is all just too dull because it follows the principle." Uh, you know what? On that, I just call Bruce. Chikung Do is what Bruce Lee developed. Now you need to develop your own your own fighting system because everybody's different. But Chikung Do is Wing Chun, boxing, and fencing. Period. Now, you want to develop your own style of chicken dough, yeah, go for it. But uh, this has been one of my things over the past 40 years. Is I'm an advocate of what I was taught. What I was taught was chicken dough is Wing Chun boxing and fencing. I was there. I know what it was. <laughs> so yeah. there's a hard line between Jeet Kune Do, the art as it was taught and Jeet Kune Do, the concept. Yes. If I, okay. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And I think that a lot of people listening could, could get behind that. I mean, we've certainly... Uh, and I have a lot of good friends who are in concepts, and that's their thing. But that's okay. That's their thing. The original is, is, is my thing, you know? And uh, we respect each other, And but, you know, I mean... I was there. I know what Jeet Kune Do was. I know what Bruce Lee developed. It was, it was taught to me when he was still alive. And, uh, but you know, but let me say this. I am involved in different martial arts, not just Jeet Kune Do. I like to tell people I'm a martial artist first, a Jeet Kune Do practitioner second. Um, I'm, I got black belts in karate, jujitsu, kempo. I'm the grandmaster of Bushido Kempo, which is a combination of combat, karate, jujitsu, and weapons. And it follows the principles of Jikundo. No karas, uh, no sport, no aesthetics. Everything is geared for combat. Simplicity. So I have taken what I have learned from Jikundo and transform that into uh, my other martial arts uh, training that I uh, I do also on the side. And uh, you'll find there's a lot of chicken and dough people that are uh, highly skilled in other martial arts also. It's just that my thing is that if somebody wants me to uh, teach them chicken and dough, I'm going to teach them chicken and dough just the way it was developed by Bruce and the way it was taught at the open school when he was still alive. Otherwise, they could just go anywhere and run whatever. It's called Chicken No. I like to take people right. back into a time tunnel and take them back there with me and teach them what was taught in the way it was taught to me so they can themselves experience that actual Chicken No, that original Chicken No, as it was taught back then. Yeah, it's not my place to change what Bruce Lee developed, what James Lee developed, and what was taught in the school. It's not my place. I'm just a disciple. I just pass it on. But I do other martial arts also, but I don't water down what was what was taught to me back there in Oakland. Sure, that absolutely makes sense. And I. I don't think anyone listening would would begrudge you not doing that. I think most, maybe I shouldn't say most, many, a lot, who knows where the line is, a good portion of martial artists do work really hard to hold true to what they were taught and to pass it on as they were taught. And I certainly have done that when I've instructed myself. So other than the instructors that you've had the opportunity to train with, if you could name someone that you would like to train with, be they alive or dead, who would that be? Oh, golly. You know, to this day, I, I still train with different people. I go to different martial arts events, and I watch other masters and grandmasters put on seminars, and, and uh, I pick up stuff from them. I'm always learning that. 
you know, I, I may watch a, uh, somebody uh, teach a uh, choking technique. And I was, oh, wow, I like that. I, I, you know, I'm going to incorporate that different, that way of moving into that choke and throw mine out and put that one in. You know, I'm always learning. As far as a particular person, you know, I can't really say because I've seen so many already. I mean, God dang, back in 1964, 63, I mean, I saw Ed Parker put on demonstrations there in Tulsa and down in Dallas. And I'll oh, just be wiped away with the speed of his hands. It would, you know, that gave me incentive to work on the speed of my hands watching Ed Parker. I saw June Reed, very young June Reed in 64, break stacks of uh, boards at a tournament. And uh, one time, a guy had six boards. They, they was on a chair. Two guys were on chairs. They were standing up on the chairs, and they held the boards up over their heads with their arms straight out, so you can imagine how high that was. And June Reed would jump up in the air and break all those boards with a front kick. You know, wow. as a as a young green belt, you just sit there with your mouth open, your tongue hanging out, and slobbering. And go, oh, dang! I see him break, uh, you know, a bunch of boards and bricks with his hands, and and uh, you know, I I had a chance. Uh, you know, I was my instructor's horse handler. You know, uh, wherever he would go, I would go. I'd have his stuff with me. You know, and uh, so. Every time he'd have meetings with the big boys, Alan Steen, Ed Parker, Jim Reed, I'd get in, you know, I, I was right there with it, you know, going, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, you know. And uh, <laughs> I was wanting to see June Reed's hands. And I, you know, because I was a Goju guy back then, you know, the big knuckles, you know, that's the big thing. The status symbols were big knuckles. And I was wanting to see his knuckles, and I saw his hands, and they were just as smooth. As a teenage girls, and I thought, how in the world, you know? And uh, but you know, you see people like that. Uh, you see all these uh, the old guys, Einstein and Burson out there fighting, and you know, you you seen it, you seen them all. And I still, you know, I go around. Like I said, uh, I do a lot of events with Bill Wallace and. Uh, we're the same age, and, you know, he'll get out there and flip out those kicks, and, you know, uh, there are just a lot of masters and grandmasters out there that are just amazing. And even though I've been in the martial arts fifth year, I'll see uh, Bill Wallace out there flipping that side kick, and, you know, that just gives me motivation to come back home and work on my side kick more, you know? <laughs> and, uh, gives me motivation to work on my side kick, too. It, it, it's, he and, is twice as good at his age than I will ever be. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, let me tell you a story. And I think a lot of the old guys will uh, will find this. If this is the case. Back uh, back in the mid-70s, I was a federal agent. And I was uh, working out with a group of older black belts. And my partner uh, was a, uh, more like a third or fourth degree black belt in Chico Root. And uh, he invited me to come and work out with his uh, geriatrics group. That's what I called him behind his back. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so I went down and worked out with him two or three times. And, man, I saw this one guy. He was a, he was a white guy, but he was a uh, master in Taekwondo. And he had been in his 70s. Man, he was flipping those kicks out there. I mean, over the head, full power. And I thought, wow. You know, I, at that time, I was like in my early 30s, and, uh, and I thought I was pretty good, you know. I saw him flipping those kicks at that age. And so finally, once I got to be accepted as their as their mascot, you know, I asked him. I said, you know, I, I'm amazed at your techniques and your speed at your age. I want to be that way when I get to be your age. Can you give me any insight? What's the, what is the secret? What do you do? He said, there's only one thing, one secret. And I said, what's that? He said, never quit doing it. Well, that hit home to me. And I took him at his word. 
and I've never quit doing it. I work out every day, and that's what keeps me alive. Has your training changed? You do things differently now than you once did? Well, you know, I don't kick to the head anymore because my back says, uh, hell no, you're not, you know. <laughs> and uh, I keep all my kicks, uh, you know, rib cage high, and, uh, but I still got the same speed I used to have. As a matter of fact, I, I think I'm better than what I used to be. And, uh, but, you know, you, as you get older, if things start falling apart. I don't care how much you work out, how good you are, you know, things, uh, disintegrate. So you have to learn to modify your workouts to, you know, uh, you like water. When you come up that big old boulder in the middle of the stream, you don't stop. You just go around it. And uh, that's what you do when you get older in the martial arts. You don't stop doing it. You just keep doing it. You just modify your workouts where you keep on going. So never quit doing it. Great advice, absolutely. So, how about how about movies? Are you at all a martial arts movie guy? Uh, no, kind of. It depends on the movie. You know, I like okay. Enter the Dragon. I like the Karate Kid. You know, uh, yeah. Kind of like Chucky's but, movies. You know, but uh, anyway, what do you got in mind? Well, that's. You basically answered it. it. Was going to be what are you? Tell us some of your favorites, and you, and you just kind of did. Okay, you know, <laughs> it's I nice and easy. One of the better. There's two really good, in my opinion, for what that's worth. Two really good martial arts movies: Enter the Dragon and The Karate Kid. And yep. uh, The Karate Kid opened up to the public an aspect of philosophy behind the martial arts that was never brought out before. And I really like that. And, uh, of course, Enter the Dragon, I mean, that's my man there. That's my granddaddy out there kicking. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> well, it probably wouldn't surprise you to know that those are the two most given answers to that question you know favorite oh, really? movies. although i don't yeah i don't know that anybody's given both of them together maybe maybe one or two people but you know we're we're well over 60 interviews at this point and it's it, we, we don't go more than a couple episodes without somebody bringing up at least one of them i mean they're they're classics i mean they're oh, yeah. i think each of them inspired a generation of people to start training oh you know, you I know was, I, really i have had I have trained thousands and thousands of people, and I have hundreds of instructors and, uh, and black belts under me. But, you know, it's amazing how many people have told me that they were inspired to be in the martial arts when they were kids and they saw Bruce Lee in the movies. So, I mean, he, he did a lot to uh, to really help promote the, uh, the martial arts uh, industry. He did. And his memory still does a lot. Is there anyone today that is better known as a martial artist than Bruce Lee? No. And I, and there isn't. And uh, we did an episode on Bruce Lee talking about him, talking about his contributions to the martial arts realm. And my personal opinion is there will never be someone that achieves that status because he came in at a time when martial arts was so new that people were clamoring to know about it. Like you said at the beginning of our discussion, if you found a karate school, it was like a golden ticket. Well, you know, it was so rare. Back when Bruce brought the combat arts to the forefront, 90% of your martial arts training was traditional. We're in the geese, katas, tournaments. Well, here comes this Chinese dude, and he just overturned that apple cart. Uh, here he is teaching the system with no katas. It's non-traditional. It's non-classical. It's the 
Chinese American martial art. It, it's 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 based on simplicity, realism, individuality. Uh, I mean, he he brought forward a fresh approach to martial arts training. And what a lot of people don't know is Bruce Lee pissed off a lot of people when he did that uh, because he, he, he rocked their boats. You know, that, that foundation that they had for years, here comes Bruce Lee, he's kicking it now. He's saying, no, this is, this is what I'm bringing forward to the martial arts, a, a, whole, new, a whole new format of training. And that, that rocked a lot of boats, and a lot of people seriously did not like Bruce. Uh, when he was alive, there was, you know, they, they talked a lot of issues about Bruce. And, of course, now after he died, all those people, that, oh, Bruce Lee was such a good guy. I knew Bruce. I taught Bruce Lee. And, you know, all this stuff started coming. It was funny. But, you know, when you live long enough like me, you get to see all that. And you sit back sure. and, and you say, well, it wasn't quite like that back then. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and a lot of people were jealous of him. You know, he's on Cato and Green Hornet. And, uh, and then he, uh, you know, got, you know, started doing the movies. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just find it interesting when you live history, you, you see how it's been revised in your lifetime right. because so much time has passed. But right. Bruce Lee, Bruce Lee is the best thing that has happened to the martial arts. I completely agree. Now, let, I want to go back for a second. Your, your comment about Jeet Kune Do being so non-traditional or, or non-classical, I think maybe was, was even a better word. Yeah. You having come up through traditional martial arts, you said you were training in Goju. What was your opinion stepping into that? Was it was it new and exciting, or did oh, you? Oh, I loved you know, it, I, man! I loved it because see, I hated katas. I hated to do katas. I love fighting. I love sparring. That was my thing. And uh, so, the way you practice. You're punching and you're kicking and your form standing there in line, throwing those punches out in the air, throwing the kicks out and you know in lines that you knees, on she yada yada. And the way you do the codice is not the way you're gonna do that technique when you're out there in a free flowing fight, a kumite with somebody. And so I always thought, well, there's two karates. There's a traditional karate, then you got your fighting, sparring karate. Now I like that. And when I got into Jeet Kune Do that first night, man, I was blown away. I thought, oh, I died and went to heaven. Everything that you practiced is the way you're going to do it when you're fighting. I mean, it's just all right there. And nothing was theoretical. And I loved it. And people think, oh, it'd be so hard for me to to transform from a traditional karate to Jeet Kune Do. It wasn't for me, man. I welcomed it. It was great. It was great. I mean, I was, I was serious, man. That first night, I thought, I, man, I died with the martial arts heaven. <laughs> that's awesome. That's a, that's such a fun story, and it's fun to to try and, and think back. Now, I mean, obviously, we have plenty of what we call modern martial arts today. Something like Krav Maga sticks out as a great example, but. As far as I know, if I'm not misspeaking, Jeet Kune Do was kind of the first one to break it is. that it cycle. Is. It is. Okay. And I was there. I know. There's nothing else out there. Nothing else out there. Yeah. You really were living history. That's so incredible. I'm so jealous. <laughs> How about books? Are you at all a reader? Have you you bring bring what you read into your curriculums, into your training? Ah, uh, man, books, too many words. I watched the movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, what kind of books are you talking about? Martial arts books. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I I got tons in here in my office. If you had to recommend a couple, 
to the listeners? You know, things cool. that have really resonated with you. Anything that you could think of? Oh, well, they're more on philosophy than they are on technique. I'd have to go in there and look. Uh, uh, I like internal energy. I'm, I'm I'm also big into internal energy development and training. And of course, that goes back to mold, the ratty days. Uh, uh, Joe Hines, he wrote a book. Mm-hmm. And I can't think of the name of it right now. I'm back here trying to... It was uh, Zen and the Martial Arts. Oh, right? yeah. Now, that's a good one. That's a good one. Uh, oh, mm-hmm-hmm. That was my first martial arts book. That was when I, I started training when I was pretty young, and and my mom bought that for us. She she had started training shortly after, and I can't even tell you how many dozens of times I read that because it's short. And if if listeners out there, if you haven't read it, it's a it's a great short book. And if if we want to be really blunt about it, it's a wonderful bathroom book. Yeah, it's it's the, I, I love that book. I'm looking here for others. Uh, but, uh, you know, when you look for something, you can't find it. Uh, right. Of course, the Dow Jukun Do is an all-time keeper. And, now, what's... Uh, I mean, of course, a, a lot of people read that. Mm-hmm. Most of whom never have and never will have any training in Jeet Kune Do. Mm-hmm. But the mm-hmm. closest thing I, I maybe have an experience to that is in Taekwondo... We have the encyclopedia that was written by General Choi laying out what Taekwondo would be, and people okay. use it as a reference. Give me a, hold on. Put a hold on that one for a second. Let me, uh, I guess more yeah. titles here before we get into the doubt. Okay. Yeah. I, another one is uh, the Karate Dojo by Peter Urban. Yep. That's a good one. Uh, there's one called Asian Fighting Arts by Don Dreger and Robert Smith. Uh, Mm-hmm. Oh, 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 Fighting to Win, Fighting to Win uh, by David Rogers. Now, these are all very good, very good philosophical books on the fighting arts. But anyway, I just saw these and I wanted to get these out there before we uh, lost that thought. But, all right, now we're yeah, back to yeah. the Dow. We're back to the Dow. No, I appreciate that. Those are great titles, and, and we've talked about a few of them on the show before. And of course, for, for anybody that might be new to the show, we have links to all this stuff, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can pop, pop over the website, check the show notes and get links and photos and all kinds of great stuff over there. So now the Tao as, I mean, really the, the book that Bruce Lee wrote, do you, how do you view that? Do you view that as a reference? Is that the gospel? No, it's not. A, I wouldn't call it a gospel because basically the Tao was composed of notes that Bruce Lee had written over many years. And all of those notes were compiled into one book. And sometimes you will find that there's uh, some things in the book that contradict other things in the book on the same subject. And it's because that Bruce changed his aspects on that subject over a period of time. And so it can be confusing to people, uh, but I mean, it's an excellent source for understanding the, like better terms and concepts, the principles behind you can go. Sure. Uh, you know, yeah, it, 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 it's, it's hard. It's great. To, and everybody should right, read it. It's, it's hard to confine you can go in one book. Uh, he's got his four volume, uh, Bruce Lee fighting methods, you know, that came out, uh, in the uh, early seventies. Uh, those are good basic how to books, you know, uh, but, uh, now I'm, as far as I'm concerned, if you're a Jukun Do practitioner and you don't have a copy of the Dao Jukun Do, uh, something wrong with you. You know, because that, uh, that's, that's the, uh, I don't know, textbook, so to speak, but don't look at it like it's the Bible, that that's the only, that's it, that's, that's the way, that's the only way. 
it's a guide. It's a guidebook. It's a good gotcha. way of putting it. That makes sense. So we've talked a little bit about your training, your your daily training, you know, your love for the martial arts. Now, outside of that, do you have goals? Are there reasons you train or things you're trying to accomplish beyond continued improvement? Something that, that you're fired up about? Well, you know, I, I train to stay alive. You know, I got type 2 diabetes and uh, compliments of Agent Orange, compliments of Vietnam, yada, yada. And uh, I got to stay healthy to stay on top of the diabetes. And uh, I watch what I eat. And, uh, but I work out a lot to, to keep control of it. And uh, so that's one reason why I work out, so I can stay alive and functional. Uh, I work out uh, because I want to keep my fighting skills up. I work out because I want to still be able to pass on what I know to other people. So that's and you know I got. I mean, this is the ball's in my court, man. I mean, I'm not going to be here. You know, I I'm 69. I'll I only got about 30 more years to live. You know. <laughs> And, uh, you know, I try to train as many people as I can to not just keep Chikung Do alive, but to keep the fighting arts alive and teach people how to, how to truly fight and survive. The good people, you know, teach good people how to yeah. fight and, uh, and wipe out the thugs. Nothing maybe is, one day we can. Nothing is as gratifying as to see some thug laying out in the middle of the street doing the chicken after some good guy just knocked the crap out of him. Last time. Is there a story there? Ah, a lot of stories, but anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably some stuff from law enforcement that you maybe you shouldn't tell us. I understand. Before or after. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. No worries. So if someone wants to get a hold of you, if someone's near Oklahoma, wants to train with you, maybe you've got seminars, you know, this is your, your opportunity for a commercial. How would, how would they go about getting a hold of you? Well, my email is P as in professor, P D L J K D. that's P D I L L J K D at AOL.com. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, Gary Dill, under Facebook. Uh, so, you know, uh, just drop me an email, catch me on Facebook. And, uh, you know, I, I do, uh, you know, uh, I'm active. Yeah. Do you travel? A lot of our guests are traveling around and, and doing seminars. Is that your thing at all? Well, it used to be. I used, to, I used to do a lot of them, but uh, with the economy the way it is, uh, it's hard to get a big enough group together for a seminar. And hopefully the economy will start getting better. And, uh, but I, I mean, yeah, I used to have a motto, half focused knit, will travel. <laughs> so you're open to it. So if people are listening and they want to, bring you oh, up yeah. to their school and train you. Okay, oh, yeah. great. Oh, yeah. That's, great, because I think, uh, you know, that's you... That's what I do. You know, there's a lot of people with schools who would like to see the original Chikung Do, and uh, I've done that a lot through the years. And... Great. Yeah, so, of course, we'll we'll have links to your contact information over, I, uh, over on the website there. I do anti-terrorist training also. Uh, yeah, I used to be, you know, actually I was in Vietnam. I was also a U.S. intelligence agent for several years, uh, in law enforcement for many years, but, uh, most of my training came from the military, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> came from the military and, uh, as an intelligence agent in this area, you know, the combatants, homeland combatants. And, uh, <coughs> so, Back right after 9 11, I was contracted by a private security company back on the East Coast who 
formulate a close quarters combat program for the Third Spatial Forces Group as per uh, some specifications they had on contract. So I put them together for them. And then uh, we took the program, uh, we taught it uh, to uh, Air Force Spec Ops units up at McGuire Air Force Base, and then uh, the Homeland Security Training Organization that trains and certified. Homeland Security personnel, military and government, and they uh, adopted my program as their official CQC program. And uh, it's uh, it's very hardcore because techniques in it are strictly uh, break, maim, and kill. Using empty hand, knives, some stick. But uh, I've been putting those on recently. People get more concerned with all the terrorism stuff that's going on. You know, I do I teach gun disarmament, how to terminate people with your empty hands, how to terminate people properly with a knife, and uh, it 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 gets gutsy. Yeah, yeah. I've been doing that as well as uh, chicken dough. And I got a lot of instructors Great. under me who do a lot a lot of the a lot of teaching and stuff. But, uh, it's all fun and games. It is. It is all fun and games. But in a nutshell, I'm not in my rocking chair, baby. <laughs> <sighs> That's great. As you shouldn't be, you have far too much to contribute to all of us still. I mean, I'm blown away talking to you today with how much you have going on and and all that you, you've done. So as we wrap up here, do you have any parting advice? for the martial artists that are listening or for anybody listening? Well, my advice is to respect everyone else in the martial arts. All martial arts are, are good. <clears throat> Excuse me. All martial arts are good. It just depends on which one is best for you. And one thing that kind of rubs me the wrong way, somebody comes in, they start knocking this system or that system and, uh, it shows me how shallow they really are. Uh, we're all martial arts brothers and sisters, and we all contribute. And uh, even though one particular martial arts is not your thing, it may be someone else's. And uh, just respect all the different martial arts out there. Not necessarily respect you know, all the instructors, because there are some maggots. But uh, the martial arts are all good. And uh, you have to find the one that works best for you. Thank you for listening to episode 66 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Professor Dill. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes, the quiz, some photos, and a video of Chi Sao, if you're not familiar with that practice. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts, we'd appreciate it. Remember... If we read yours on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of whistle kick stuff. If you know someone that would be a great interview for the show, please fill out the form at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. We're pretty much everywhere you can think of, and our username is always whistlekick. And remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our great line of sweatshirts. Pull over and zip, thick ones, thin ones, and lots of colors. There's something for everyone. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. Well, let's see. There's the one about the instructor at Golden Gate Park. There's one about the fruit guys from San Jose. There's one about the weapons. Uh, you know, the weapons would be good. Because, kind of give you a brief background, you know, I've been in karate for years, and I've been there, I was there with James now for a few months, and I thought, well, you know, we're going to do weapons. So, I, I decided to ask him, and that was a mistake. And uh, I asked him, you know, uh, when are we going to start doing weapons? And then he grinned at me. Ooh, I knew then that was trouble. For James Lee to grin, and I knew I stepped in it. 
And he looked at me and said, well, where you been? We've been doing weapons. I thought, oh, God, I know I stepped in. I know I did. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and then he said, okay, look, this is how it works. When you learn Jeet Kune Do, you already know weapons. You take your empty hand Jeet Kune Do techniques and you put a weapon in it. And you just do Jeet Kune Do using the weapon. Of course, each weapon has its own personality and you make modifications in the technique to fit the weapon. But why learn a whole different martial art weapon system when you have it all right here in Jeet Kune Do? Made sense. And to that day, my whole weapons program is based upon his philosophy of using Jeet Kune Do. I can imagine that grin there. Oh, God. And knowing, oh. He's, uh, he's stoic. He's stoic, you know. <laughs> and so when he grinned, I thought, oh, I'm out of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I know that grin. I, I've, you know, I think, I, I, I mean, I've, I've tested for black belt, you know, in a couple different schools and several times, and and I, nobody's ever taught me that grin. But every instructor I've ever had has had that grin, so I know exactly what you're talking about. I don't know, I don't know when you learn it, but maybe I haven't. And I don't know it. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then there's this, one. About yeah. the exclusive well, exclusivity of Jeet Kune Do back then. And uh, I was in a class, my first class. There's all white guys. And they were all wearing karate, white karate geek pants. And I knew something was not right because my question was, where's the Chinese? You know? And, uh, so, you know, trained there for that first month and then James came down and he said, uh, okay, I'm not feeling good. Uh, so I'm going to, uh, I'm, uh, I'm stopping this class and we'll shut it down. I, I don't feel good. So I'm not going to keep this class going. And I thought, oh man, are you kidding me? I've been waiting for years ever since Cato in 1966, man, I've been waiting to learn this, and here I am. I'm here. I, I'm here. And now the rug has just been pulled out from underneath me because there's so much I learned in that month. It was just, it was amazing. Uh, just flat amazing. And now it's gone. I mean, I was just totally just depressed. And he picked up on it during class. Well, class was over. And uh, so I picking up my gear. And just go on home. And uh, he said, you wait, you wait, you wait. Oh, okay. And uh, so these three guys couldn't find out they, they were all karate instructors from a big school in San Jose. And uh, so we were standing there at his garage door and he was telling them goodbye and all that stuff. And I just standing back there in the background. And he gave them a brand new two-ended bag, you know, the round ball with the punji cords on it, you know? Yeah. And he, it's brand new, still in the box that martial arts supply sent to him a few days before. He gave it to him. And uh, so anyway, they were walking down the driveway, going through the car. He was waving at them. They was waving back. And, and then he looked at me. He said, those suburbs, it, those suburbs, it. I said, what? what? What do you mean? He said, oh, if, if Bruce was here, he'd kill him. I said, what's going on? He said, those three guys, they were teaching Jeet Kune Do there at their karate school in San Jose behind our backs. Oh, yeah, if Bruce was here, he'd kill him. I said, why did you give him that, that new bag? He said, oh, man, that thing. That thing will kill him. <laughs> Give it to them. <laughs> that <I'll> kill him. <laughs> and I said, well, okay, I guess I'll go now. And he's, no, 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 no. He says, so, you want to really learn Jeet Kune Do? I said, oh, yeah. Then I started perking up. I knew something was coming in. 
He said, okay, now, you be here next week on these days. Oh, okay. Now I'm doing a Snoopy dance, you know. So the following week, I came back and uh, look, walked in the garage, and I was the only round eye in there that was all Chinese. That's when we really started rocking and rolling. <laughs>